Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest Weather Watch. Today is January 11th and right now we are looking at the dynamic tropopause potential temperature here and really all it's showing is the very cold air over the polar regions versus the warmer air across the tropics and subtropics of planet Earth here. Looking at the northern hemisphere, Alaska, BC, Washington, Oregon, there's Greenland, there's the Hawaiian Islands, Pacific Ocean here. There goes our mid-latitude cyclone off the coast of North America here, bringing an atmospheric river into the west coast. We'll take a look at those impacts here in a moment. But to put this into motion here, you can see where the mid-latitude cyclone development is along the temperature gradient here across the mid-latitudes. Makes sense, right? And you can continue to see these systems move through the Pacific Northwest and down into California here over the next several days. We'll take a look at those in a more detailed look here in a moment. Now, mid-level mid water vapor loop here. You can see this big low off the coast of North America here. Little mesoscale lows rotating around it make for a very interesting satellite Im image here. Atmospheric river pointed at the west coast here. We'll take a look at those precipitation amounts here in a moment. Now, looking at that low pressure out here, you notice it will start to fill as we go through the day today and tonight. We're going to bring some systems that will continue to bring precip across mainly western Oregon, Washington, B.C. here. The further you go east, the less the precipitation would pretty typical. But as we go on into this week, and you can see additional systems coming towards the west coast, we'll have to watch some of these too. Some pretty good gradient here showing up on this one on the European, the 12Z, hot off the presses here, just started at 4 a.m. And you can see additional systems down there. California and the potential for more systems does exist as we go on in through early next week across Pacific Northwest. Now this is looking short term here, the NAM3 cam, a high resolution model, 80 meter wind speeds, and you'll see the easterly component here as we go through this afternoon and evening across the Washington Cascades down the Strait of Juan de Fuca as well. And we might get some gusty winds through the Stampede Gap here again this evening and tonight across the area here. And some pretty decent winds coming for the coastline at times also on in through Thursday as well. Now you can see here, accumulated max 10 meter wind gusts. I'm going to let this play out here. And you can see the Stampede Gap getting some pretty good gusts here. Look at that red showing some gusts up towards 60 miles per hour out there towards the Stampede Gap. Uh, you know, the typical North Bend, Enumclaw areas are probably going to get windy again as we go through tonight. Southwest Oregon coast, some gusty winds moving all the way up the Oregon coast towards the Washington coast as we go on in through tomorrow, shown here. Just offshore, some really big winds, 70 plus are possible. So we'll have to watch for this, you know, as we go on in through tomorrow. Be prepared for that along the immediate coastline there and through the Stampede Gap and typical east wind areas down the Strait of Juan de Fuca as well. Probably a bit of gusty winds going down through the gorge there. Uh, Washington Oregon border. This is Tillamook out here. You can see it does highlight some areas of stronger winds but nothing too crazy for the coastline there. Stampede Gap, I think the Euro might be underdoing this here. Gusts up in the 30s but they're probably going to get a little bit stronger locally out there across the Stampede Gap region. Now this is looking at total precipitation here. Let me just update this since we can get one hot off the presses here. Nope, not up to date yet. Actually it's back out to the European here. The deterministic will be updated. There it is. Now, as we go into motion, you see Oregon gets it first, comes up through western Washington as we go through tonight into tomorrow morning, spreads up north into B.C., bringing some precip for the Cascades, Oregon, Washington, and Vancouver Island coastlines here. And, uh, yeah, so you can see the precipitation continuing down here for northern California as well. Doesn't get that far east of the Cascades into eastern Oregon, Washington, shown here. Now we're out towards Saturday afternoon. Keep putting this in motion here. And you can see we kind of slow and steady build up the precipitation across western Oregon, Washington, mainly highlighting the coastal regions and the higher terrain here, as showing about Tuesday afternoon of next week, shown there. Now taking a look here, day one excessive rainfall outlook does include southwest Oregon here. Day two does include some of the Olympic Mountains here. This would include Vancouver Island as well. And day three, again, the Olympics and probably Vancouver Island as well, if the uh, excessive rainfall outlook did extend up there. Now this is looking at cumulative precipitation on a 15-day scale on the bottom, a 3-day scale on the left. When you're on the right of this red line, you can expect increased landslide risk. And this is just the Puget Sound Metro here, but this is going to go for a lot of the areas across Pacific Northwest, including coastal areas especially. We've been getting more precipitation and will get more precipitation than much of the inland valleys like the Willamette Valley and Puget Sound. But you can see the forecast for like Everett, and uh, Payne Field here, Seattle, Tacoma, is getting very close to the red line here, Tacoma Narrows, for example. So we could be dealing with some landslide potential here uh, over the next few days. 
This is the drought monitor. We're gonna have some drought um, removal here coming up, probably for Western Washington, especially. Some of the Puget Sound is still technically in moderate drought. That'll be probably going away here in the next several days. And you can kind of see here, this, this tan area says, drought remains but improves here across much of the West. And you can see drought removal likely is the green here. But hopefully we can improve some of this drought condition across eastern Oregon. I mentioned that from time to time, but they've been really hit hard here for with drought here across some of the east slopes of the Oregon Cascades. This is total snow ratio. You know, it's not a big snow maker we're looking at, although some of the higher peaks could be getting some decent amounts across the area. And you can see as we go on in through this weekend and into next week, no lowland snow as of yet mainly across the higher terrain of northeast Washington, northeast Oregon, the Cascades, of course, up through Vancouver Island, and some of the higher peaks across the Olympics and Vancouver Island shown there. Now, this is looking at overall winter storm impacts, day one through three. Nothing too crazy, just maybe some nuisance stuff going across the passes there. So no major winter storms look imminent across Stevens, Snoqualmie, and as you go down through the Cascades of Oregon right now. But just kind of watch out, have that in the back of your mind, especially across northeast Oregon as well. This is avalanche danger here. So we're looking at considerable for some areas that a lot of people go, you know, Wenatchee, Levensworth, if you're out there snowmobiling, snowshoeing, hiking, have a heads up for that. It's a really good site. They update it quite frequently. Even the moderate extends all the way down towards the Mount Hood region of Oregon there as well. This is something they show you on the website here too. They see they've cut through this layer of snow and they can tell when these layers formed and that's what causes avalanche conditions here. You get these layers that differ from each other. The density in snow is different and that can cause um, land, uh, yeah, avalanches here. Sorry, I'm stuck on landslides. But yeah, this will cause avalanches there. Basically, you can get wind that will trigger it. Humans can trigger it. All kinds of stuff. So heads up if you're in the backcountry. Pay attention to that website. It's very good. This is Whistler here. You can see we're going to spend some time above freezing on a lot of the passes here over the next few days, but hopefully in the extended we can bring that back down. Going further south along the Cascade Snoqualmie Pass, we're going to be above freezing here as we go on in through the weekend as well, as well as Mount Hood shown here. Now this is looking at $2022 billion weather and climate disasters here. You can see we did pretty good across the west here compared to the portions east of the Rocky Mountains for the most part. It's tornado outbreaks, you know, hailstorms, flooding, uh, hurricanes, tropical systems out here. Wildfires were pretty bad across New Mexico. But we did have that western heat drought wave of 2022 here that did go up over a billion dollars. But we had the forest fires. They just weren't the huge dynamic ones, but they were really persistent across from the Puget Sound. As you guys know, you don't need me to remind you about that, but they really didn't cause that much damage comparatively. Now, this is looking at La Nina here. We're in January right now, and we're going to do a rapid climb out of La Nina most likely here. I've been showing this week by week as we go. Taking a look at the Equatorial Pacific, you can see La Nina at the beginning of December is dominating pretty well, but you can see the yellow is starting to show up here on the coast of South America and starting to infiltrate across the equatorial portions of the Pacific Ocean here, and this will bring us into neutral conditions probably in the next month or two with uh, El Nino possible as we go on into next year. And this is looking at those probabilities. We are in La Nina now. This was as of December. This is January. As we go on into February, we're actually 50-50 La Nina in neutral conditions. Then neutral looks like it's going to take over as we get into March, April, May, June. And I will be doing a video separate of a briefing here on what we can expect as we go into neutral and La El Nino conditions here. As you can see, by the time we get out towards next uh, by August here, Later in the summertime, we look to be in El Nino territory. Now looking at this, this is a GFS, Pacific North American Oscillation. This was run January 9th afternoon of, and you can see that we are going to spend some time in negative territory if you believe the GFS coming up here. So we may have kind of a pattern change as we go through later January into February. It's still a long ways out there right now, and it's just kind of reading the tea leaves, just probability-based stuff right now. So just something to watch for now. And again, this is the Pacific North American Oscillation negative here. It kind of means the troughing is over the continent and you get the north and northwest flow, cooler weather conditions across Pacific Northwest shown by the high pressure or classified, you know, 
that high pressure that lives by the Aleutians when this occurs here is kind of the driving factor for bringing that north flow back into the Pacific Northwest. And when we're in positive, which what we kind of been in here for the last couple of weeks here, you get the low pressure and the storm track is out over the Pacific here with higher pressure over the continent. Now this is looking at the European weeklies here. We're kind of looking way out into the future here. This is the temperature at 5,000 feet, 850 millibars. And as we go on in through early February, you'll notice kind of that anomaly showing up here across some of BC and Western US here for below average temperatures a lot. So, you know, snow lovers, we might get one more shot here as we go through February. And you guys know the last few years we've been doing pretty well uh, during the month of February as far as snowfall here across Pacific Northwest. So, Anyway, yeah, I uh, got back last night from California out there. I'll continue to do briefings for other parts of the country when things get active in those regions here. But, I'll, you know, I was born and raised here in the Pacific Northwest. I will always do briefings here. I understand the weather here better than I do anywhere else in the world, really. But I'll be covering places like Hawaii and even off towards the east if big events come and whatnot. You know, I, I enjoy doing it. But I'll also be working on my windstorm um, updates coming up here. I'm going to do some more windstorm stuff. We've got to go through the top five windstorms here across the Pacific Northwest. We're going to do an Arctic air outbreak across the Pacific Northwest too. I'll pick the best Arctic outbreaks in the last 50 years, maybe 70 years. And we'll go over those each individually as well. So... Um, yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Hope you guys like the live streams down there. Things got a little bit crazy at times down there, but it was kind of a fun trip overall. It was pretty interesting. But anyway, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll do this again tomorrow. We'll check out what kind of precept we're going to be dealing with. We'll see what the extended shows as well and see if anything, if we can pick up on that pattern change onto the extended. We'll continue to look out there as well. So anyway, glad to be back here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'll talk to you guys tomorrow.